Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Amber Data Derivatives Podcast. I'm here with Evgeny Gavboy. He's the founder and CEO of Wintermute, which is one of the biggest market making and prop firms in the crypto space. Evgeny, how are you? Oh, really good and uh, really excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited to have you on. So maybe for anyone who's new to your firm, maybe you could just give us a brief overview of what you guys do over at Wintermute and some of your guys' activities, prop trading side, and then on the liquidity providing side, stuff like that. Yep, sounds good. Wintermute has been around for about six and a half years. Uh, we, we're basically active in pretty much everything on the crypto side. So I, I guess it's like three main uh, core activities that we are doing. Uh, one is basically CFI trading. So we are trading all the major uh, cryptocurrency exchanges like Binance, Coinbase, Kraken, you name it. Uh, second one is DeFi, and that's basically something that we've been doing since 2019. Um, start, start with just integration with DYDX, where back when, the, back when it was uh, V1, uh, the DeFi summer, and basically all the way to current uh, state of things, where we are one of the major players on DeFi, beyond like Ethereum and L2s and Solana and what else. Um, and on the C is kind of like the third big thing that we are doing. Uh, we offer sport, we offer derivatives, we offer options, we offer pretty much everything uh, over the counter, uh, both uh, both kind of like uh, voice chat kind of style, but also via our API. So. Oh, that's fantastic. So you really cover all the three main venues, CFI, DeFi, and OTC. So. With uh, since you have both liquidity providing uh, services as well as prop trading, what would you say is maybe like the percentage of employees who are working on the prop side versus the liquidity providing side, and, and how big is Wintermute right now? So starting with the last question, it's about hundred people uh, currently at Wintermute. Uh, it would be hard to kind of split because basically the whole goal of the company, like the way we kind of differentiate ourselves from competitors is we are trying to be very generalist uh, pro trader firm. We basically yeah, cover all possible uh, directions uh, from that perspective. And uh, like activity at any given moment, it can be like if, if that particular one, I don't know, if it's uh, Bitcoin ETFs listed, then probably our OTC desk will be much more active because of the execution of those. If there is a new token launch, it's probably DeFi or CFI uh, people being busy because of uh, all the like new crazy token uh, listings. So it's it's very like it's very diversified and very generalist. So that's how we like position ourselves very differently to a lot of our competitors. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And then when we look at like Delta One products versus option products or products that have convex payoffs, you know, what are some of the the nuances? that you guys deal with when you're kind of trading option markets versus Delta One products, and when you're trading CFI versus DeFi, how, how do you guys think about those types of different risks? Yeah, I think starting with uh, Delta One versus options, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's primarily on the, just like how the payoffs are very different, like the upside and downside is obviously very different for altcoins. Like it's it's very much on like stocks. Okay, I mean stocks can still go like two x or three x or some acquisition in news, but you generally don't expect it. While for alts especially, they can like double or triple in a day. So you do need to factor it in on your models effectively, and it can be quite challenging. And uh, apart from that, yeah, plus the correlations are not always perfect as well. Like you cannot hatch your I know arbitrary inputs with uh, Ethereum inputs, mm -hmm. not necessarily always, like sometimes it just won't work at all. So that's, that's I guess, like the main challenge. Uh, and CFI, DeFi is just very different tech stacks and also very different competitors. Like we see like competitors on DeFi are very different from CFI competitors. And it's also like very different kind of, kind of like, also like expertise is still similar, like you still look into all the nitty gritty details of pricing and execution and how things work. But, uh, like DeFi is very, it's like different, different style to your normal CFI trading, uh, primarily from just like how architecture of the whole market works is just a uh, very, very different. So you need to think about, yeah, like how block building works, for example, you need to kind of expand the whole stack, which is kind of similar to how 
I don't know, like if you think about centralized trading, whereas I know which evolved from just screen trading to actually only microwave towers and uh, like radio waves and what's not like it's it's kind of like similar in the way of like thinking about like how deep you go uh the technology and like hardware uh defies like similarly need to like go way beyond just trying to shoot for that uh, interesting uh, trade oh uh, yeah that's really interesting and so before starting Wintermute, you actually worked at Optiver. Maybe we could just jump back in time a little bit and you know, kind of hear about how you got started in the markets and, and what did you do back at Optiver? Yeah. So at Optiver was kind of like unique in a way because like how things work at Optiver still last week to this day is you typically don't stay in the same place for a long time. Mm. Like you're on one spot covering, I don't know, future spreads and then three years later you move to, I don't know, Trade sector indices, for example, and then three years later you do something else, and well, like ADRs, for example. I don't know, like you keep like moving around. I was at ETFs for most of my ten years at Optiver, uh, primarily because I pretty much sort of like started this activity, or more like expanded it in the like a very big state uh, back at Optiver, and so I was at ETFs for yeah you know, most of my ten years, and it was quite interesting because uh, during those ten years, Optiver grew from like sort of like late startup kind of vibe is still like not so many people. I think it was like 300 people when I joined to like a proper corporate uh, with, I think it's like close to 2000 people now. It's like all the control functions you can think of. So it's like much bigger, much more robust, but also kind of like more bureaucratic, more like a bit less exciting maybe, but it's still a powerhouse. Like it's like, it's, it's very successful. Like, yeah, it, it, it's it's really nice for them that they don't have to disclose the numbers, but like they, they're doing really well. And I guess learning learning wise, it's also it's, it's a very different place from other prop trading firms um, because if you think about your standard, I don't know, Citadel or Tau or whatever, like it's all usually pod based, so you have like mm. multiple teams under the same roof, often competing with each other. While at October, it's all it's all very open, so like. You don't have teams competing with, with each other. You actually have a lot of cooperation, which is reflected on one hand that people just know what everyone is doing. So nobody is hiding stuff. Uh, it's also reflected in the shared bonus pool. So I don't know, if Sydney office makes like a lot of money on something, like on ETFs, for example, then Chicago, Chicago traders will actually benefit from that as well in their bonus. So it's kind of like very socialistic, uh, but like in a good way, because it, it basically forces people to cooperate because you know like if the guy next to you makes a million it will go into your bonus as well so that's kind of nice and it's also another really great sign that like at least when i was there that was it like a lot of people were shareholders as well it was very much encouraged so not only there was a shared bonus pool which was very transparently calculated so it was not like very so it was not really discretionary it was very familiar but also everyone was a shareholder so Basically, Optiver gave a lot of uh, opportunities for people to own as much as possible and get exposure as much as possible to the rest of the company. And that's kind of like what I took with me to Wintermeet as well. Like I copy pasted a lot of those things because I thought they were pretty well. And yeah, I see like other trading firms that are built like in a different way. And uh, yeah, I kind of like think that this way is very different and somewhat superior as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. So that's a the pod based example. When I was prop trading in Chicago, we definitely had that with multiple strategies. Algo does a talk to discretionary, does a talk to options, does a talk to futures, and it creates this sort of incentive where you find a strategy you don't want to share it because otherwise everyone's going to pile into your trade. But it sounds like Optiver was really the opposite of that, which is kind of an open communication. And it's really interesting about encouraging uh, the traders to become shareholders as well. Um, that's a that's very unique. So at Wintermute, you, you said you know you borrowed some of those ideas. So are some of the traders shareholders in Wintermute? Does Wintermute have multiple strategies, but everyone co collaborate? Yeah, pretty much. Like I think we even I would say we even more collaborative than Optiver in that regards because it's like it's even more like it's just like one team almost like for C five that, that does everything. Uh, so it's very collaborative. Uh, but even like between like C5 and D5 and uh, OTC, like it's, it's all 
like people like sometimes the same people actually do, do the same things uh, as and that's for shareholders i think yeah more than half well way more than half of people are shareholders not determined Wow, that's cool. And then you mentioned you were on the ETF desk at Optiverse. So is this more on the like creation redemption side as an authorized provider, or is it like trading uh, in index options on the ETFs or equity options on ETFs? Kind of, what what kind of uh, strategies with the ETFs? Yeah, so it started with like index, uh, like blue chip indices, basically like S and P, Euro stocks, stocks, like. Those like the most easy to price ones, mm. the ones which have like a listed future on. So that's kind of like where it all started. And then like I started expanding a bit, a bit more. Like first we started covering uh, like short and leveraged ones, which I think is yeah really horrible structure for retail people. But okay, let's 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 like <laughs> see for another talk, I guess. Uh, and then we expand the sector uh, like sector ones uh, like equity sector ETFs which basically didn't have a perfect hedge so we actually had to set up a whole hedge and single stocks for this and then basically the other basically in the equity outside of Europe and US or like all this like emerging market stuff which is like very fun to price no. uh, sometimes and like other asset classes like commodities uh, FX uh, bonds oh yeah that's interesting so I guess like when you're talking about the ETFs with futures, like it's almost like trading the SPY ETF versus the S&P 500 futures and kind of trading some sort of basis. Oh, yeah. uh, that's really interesting. But but Europe, like because I was trading primarily European ones, Europe was interesting because there was not like one SPY, there were like kind of 20 euro stocks ETFs. And they were, yeah, like not all, not like <laughs> with every year it was getting more and more difficult uh, to trade and price them because like you have I don't know kind of like dividend similarities uh, between countries and some countries like uh, France and Italy as explain as well at some point they, they introduced some kind of like stamp duty which also factored into the creation redemption process so it's like there were a lot of like things building up making it more and more complex uh, every year which I kind of enjoyed because it's kind of like on one hand it's very very simple okay your stocks goes up you buy the ETF or like it's, it's very easy to call it but if you miss out on the dividend, if you miss out on some uh, position or stock split, like you can basically go into the market and be surprised and you get wiped out by a market maker who did the homework well. Wow. So like my goal was to be a market maker who did the homework well. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Kind of just jumping to the ETFs real quick, because it's pretty interesting now that we have the Bitcoin spot ETF here in the US, um, the cash redemption creation process. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is when the ETF freshly launches and a bunch of shares are created, um, there's cash deposited at the issuer and then the issuer later on goes and buys Bitcoin. Um, and on day one of trading, that's that could be a big move because 100% of the of the assets need to go buy Bitcoin. But later down the line, uh, it's really at the margin, maybe 50 basis points of the assets need to be converted. Is that the right thinking where we could see deviations in price early on in the ETF and not so much later on? I think the creation redemption process doesn't pay much into it. It's more like it's just like how wide the creation redemption spread is mm. for the issue. Because it would, if it were like in kind, it would be much more like it would be much easier. Yeah, right. Because then all the market makers would just provide Bitcoin and so it is create in kind. I think it's very stupid that SSC made this rule, frankly, because it's uh, it just like creates unnecessary friction. It creates like way more costs for retail investors to do things that way because currently yeah, it just yeah pe people basically try to well pe basically market makers who execute those orders so like liquidity providers who execute those orders they have to do it within a certain time, time frame window which is different for some ETF issuers and for others and like the whole market knows that so like because they can seriously be front run uh, like it's 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 not the most efficient way to do things yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so jumping into sort of the Chad Five versus crypto space. So when not when we look at Delta One products and option products in Chad Five, would you say that vol markets are a lot have a lot more potential for edge than Delta One markets in Chad Five? And do you, if so, would you say that's also true for crypto? Is there more edge in the vol markets versus the Delta One products, or is it still kind of so fresh that there's um, opportunities across the board? 
Yeah, I think like from my like I don't have that much experience with uh, wall products. Like I like we have a team looking at, but like I'm all the Delta One guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but from what I see, it's like it's much easier to push walls around compared to platform markets. Like we see, like we can see, like just one guy coming in and do like massive trades, and he moves the wall by like by a few points very easily. Um, so like there is definitely this aspect, and you need to be prepared to I don't know not waste all your I don't know, position limits on one, uh, like right, right away and just be ready to retreat with your habit on your, like on your risk, for example. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, speaking of TradFi, if we look at firms like Citadel and DRW that have multiple pods and teams doing different things in the market, I th I've read before that one of the edges that they have is looking at their own execution to see re really where truly the market is trading. Winterbute seems to have also this type of advantage where if you guys are trading CFI, OTC, and DeFi, there's a lot of good information from sort of across the across the venues. Would you say that that is a, a useful edge for you guys? And do you ever see deviations between DeFi and CFI and OTC flows? Yeah, I think it's 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 ultimately it's a very good like you, you need to take all this into account for like to get the best idea of where the flows are coming from. Yeah. Uh, I mean, OTC is very simple. Like we are very well connected on OTC side of things, especially on alts. Uh, so we often know before others that like there is a big buyer seller, for example, which obviously like is super useful. Um, in DeFi, it's it's much more um, how to call it like it's much more public. So like everyone knows which transactions. Like if it's a Ethereum mainnet, everyone knows which transactions I'm about to go through. So. But you still like you need to have this different place to actually know what's inside the mempool and what's what's about to like mm. change the market. So it's it's a, it's obviously beneficial to actually have those all this like infra build being built and uh, which makes us competitive in DeFi, but also provides uh, signals for CFI and all that. Oh, that's fascinating. And then you guys actually offer OTC altcoin like options and Delta One products that you can't find elsewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's because, yeah, again, like we, we have so much flow on the, like from like foundations and the, like uh, different OTC counterparties. It's, it's, it really makes sense for us to follow like, more complex strategies. So it's it's not just like calls and boosts, but it's, uh, yeah, we often get us for like more exotic, esoteric stuff. And, uh, oh, that's fantastic. And then you mentioned that working with foundations. So like, do protocols reach out to Wintermute in order to gain liquidity for their tokens? Let's say I'm a new protocol and, I, and I'm and i launching a DeFi product and I have a native token. Um, is that something you guys help provide liquidity for? Yeah, like it's it's one of the kind of like one of the business lines. So it, it's been around for two or three years in the space. So it's like people have been doing it, I think, since 2020 more or less. Uh, it's, it has to do with basically those tokens not having a good market or basically on the listing date. So it's a bit like how IPOs work, I guess, when you have a bank that provides liquidity on the open and basically market makers, well, liquidity providers for those token protocols. It's a kind of like overall similar. Oh, cool. And if any protocols wanted to work with, with Wintermute to like do those types of services or if there's any traders out there, um, looking to trade with Wintermute or work for Wintermute? Is that uh, something they can get in touch with uh, someone over at your team? And if so, how did they do that? I think the best, I think for protocols, the best is just connect to, to us via the website. I think there are like all kinds of useful links there. Um, as for traders, yeah, I think it's basically the best to apply. Um, and we'll see. I, I would say like the main thing is that because we are not bot based, so we don't do like like a lot of trading firms, they do like profit share kind of structures. We, we don't do that. Like it's all just like a doctor where it's like it's very from the leg, very like very transparent. So we don't do like special deals. Like if a star trader comes to us and tells us, well, I can make 20 million for you, like we are not going to structure comp around them. Mm. Like we, we're still going to apply the same structures for everyone else, which, which is quite important for me, like to, to make it very transparent and clear, like how everyone operates. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Very cool. And we'll have the links in the description for the website and other information, by the way. Um, so kind of jumping on the more personal side, do you have any sort of crazy trading stories that jump to mind over your career that you'd like to share with listeners? 
uh, yeah, I don't know. Like it's crypto is for I guess. Like the, uh, I think like USDC from uh, last year was very fun one because like you really needed to do the homework, like read those because yeah, there was this massive DPEG at some point the trade like going way below point nine even, and so like you really needed to dig into like how the basic was a Fed would still pay and then rescue those banks where circles uh, were reserves were in and like basically trying to understand, okay, what, what are the risks and everything. And basically we did all this homework. Uh, we picked a position. It was uh, like, it was a very profitable at the end of the day, but yeah, it was, it was a bit scary at some point, but yeah, it was fun. I think my, my favorite, my, my personal probably train story of all time, it's goes, goes back to October where Basically, uh, when Fox, uh, it's about Volkswagen because I was uh, still a junior guy. Uh, it was literally like my first year at Optima, and so uh, I was basically I just to this like ETF slash basket trading desk, and I was trading ducks. So I was trading Volkswagen um, implied, um, and yeah, I do remember that that very well because it, at some point it was basically but like basically what happens it was a massive short squeeze in Volkswagen, and it was. Uh, very briefly, uh, the most the top valued stock in the world. Wow! So, like, think about like whatever Nvidia does now. But I said was Volkswagen, just some random German car manufacturer for the day. And yeah, I basically on my desk I was like very junior, but I I just like again thought about it, didn't make any sense, and I basically took this took this like implied short Volkswagen position. Uh, by selling Dux futures and buying the Dux basket, except Volkswagen. Oh, nice. Um, and yeah, that, that was probably my first big trade ever, which was, which felt really good. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Cause I imagine when there's a short squeeze like that in the stock, it's basically impossible to borrow the shares. So how do you short it? So it's really interesting that you can reconstruct the index versus the underlying basket minus, <laughs> minus the short. Yeah. So that's that's really interesting, and the SVB situation was yeah that was that was pretty interesting. So what what's the thinking there? So SVB banking crisis crashes. Do you have what maybe ten percent of the reserves at SVB? So you could think of the probability of getting maybe eighty cents back, and then you know that the rest is safe. So true value is maybe ninety eight cents, and then you could kind of imply that oh I can buy USDC for ninety. Well, it was more about I think it was more about timing. Like it was pretty much clear that Fed would cover it. Because they they claim to that to that regard, uh, it was more a question of timing whether the money will be stuck for like a month, for example, and so the USDC would be like debacked for a month, for example, because nobody can can basically redeem. So that that was I guess the main like the main challenge with this. Uh, but ultimately, like I felt very sure that like it should be back to normal. Uh, it, it did help a lot that Circle was, was very transparent about how things worked and we could actually like reach them and uh, verify things. So I think that that was like a very interesting one. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's fascinating. And some of the CFI markets actually reacted in an interesting way too, where like the linear perpetuals and Bybit, which had USDC based options, everything kind of traded uh, in interesting fashions during that. Um, yeah, let's go. the DeFi protocols are like that, like a lot of them just hard coded USDC to one, which didn't help them. Mm. <laughs> and it was, uh, I think it was even more evident when, uh, uh, when it was at when, when uh, USD debacked and died, because that was a similar case. Like a lot of DeFi, well, some DeFi protocols uh, just hard coded USD to one uh, and just completely failed as a result. Wow, wow, interesting. And so what brought you into crypto from the TradFi markets? When did that spark really ignite? I think it was just volatility, to be honest. Like being a TradFi, I had maybe one or two days a year when it was exciting. Like I can like I can just remember, I know, when the Swiss uh, rate uh, decision, for example, that was like a big day, or Trump, or Brexit, like those like really big days when things happen or like 2008 crisis like when things happen but then like nothing happens afterwards and usually like if you see i don't know half percent move on the day that's usually something exciting um and then you come to crypto and then like my first kind of like engagement well, my first 
first time I'm like kind of like Metable TO2 was okay, I just downloaded the Coinbase app back in like beginning of 2017. And I, I put some like very small amount of Bitcoin for the first time in my life, just trying on YouTube, just to like test it out. And then like a bit later, I'm looking at it and like double surprise. Wow. And okay, like, okay, <laughs> you have my attention. <laughs> But like wow, once you see this kind of volatility, okay, that that sounds like way more exciting than trading nine or euro stocks or ETFs, obviously. So it's, uh, that that's like what caught me initially. But then over the years, I kind of like got into the general out of philosophy, if you may. Like I, I actually genuinely understood. Okay, it's actually like really interesting technology. It's really interesting way to do things differently. So. I came from, like, I came, I came for the volatility, but I stayed for five years, I guess. Yeah, very cool. And one of the things you mentioned earlier is that, you know, in crypto ball, one large trader can kind of move the market around because the market's still relatively thin. Do you think these types of trends are going to change now that we have a spot Bitcoin ETF and more mm, investors with deeper pockets uh, can start engaging in these markets is it do you expect it to get more efficient and the volatility to come down what do you think this etf will have in terms of impact on the market yeah i think it ultimately it will like ultimately it will have become something like gold i guess mm. but in the meantime i think it will actually like it will amplify the moves a lot in general because people will suddenly have this new instrument to use when they want to gamble Bitcoin price. So like the next time we we'll see a massive bull run, which might be happening now, or we know. Like we see, we will see those inflows amplified, but we also see those outflows amplified as well. So I think we'll see actually in the short to mid term amplified volatility because of because there is just like more instruments available to people who didn't have the access before. Yeah, interesting. So now there's like a new highway built for a new class of investors, and that might magnify the moves like we're seeing yeah. potentially right now. Very interesting. What about uh, DeFi derivatives? Is that something that you find exciting? I'm I'm a big fan of a lot of these DeFi option protocols. Um, do you do you guys you know play in this field? Do you guys watch what's going on in DeFi derivatives? I like we 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 integrated with quite a few of them. We like. Like I mentioned, like DYDX is one of them, but like also, like we have friends with a lot of them, like we are tags, Griffin. Um, like we, we, like we integrate with a lot of them. Like I wouldn't be able to like, actually list all of them uh, straight away. I think like the biggest challenge for them is the liquidation stuff, just how to cross liquidations, especially for options. Like the biggest unsolved challenge is how to give leverage and like liquidate people in order to discussion because. Of course, you can just launch options, uh, which you can, which you just need to prefund uh, one to one. But that's not not super efficient for market makers. Mm -hmm. Like it can be fine for individual investors, but even then, like they don't get the leverage. So you need trade options for leverage quite often. So like, what's what's the point? And for market makers, it's just like not efficient. And so a lot of those protocols, they realized that okay, like first we need to build the perpetual markets, and then we need to put options market on top of it. Because then you can do like uh, offset, offset the deltas at least. So, like you, you can give people more leverage. Well, at least market makers more leverage by doing that. Um, but still, you need to like work out your liquidation engine, work out, work out like how to do it, like how to cross margin in ideally as well, which is super difficult. Like it's really super difficult in the trade buy. Um, and you like, yeah, we all saw like what happened with FTX, for example, yeah. who had like this great cross, uh, like cross liquidation and everything, like everything was like, well, cross margin accounts and everything, but at that, at the end of the days of what firm we work for. <laughs> um, and it's, it's genuinely like a really hard challenge to crack. Like we actually had to, had to build it on our side for our risk engine, for example, because we have so many OTC counterparties who do. Mm options and other derivatives we need to we need to have a model to effectively yeah manage the cross margin for example to to be able to give them competitive terms so like for DeFi protocols like especially if they're truly really DeFi, so they don't just like outsource some stuff out of chain but they're but they actually like truly really DeFi that they allow liquidations and it's it's a very hard not to crack i don't think it's impossible but it's quite hard yeah, yeah, that's really interesting, especially with options. You need good theoretical values at all times because the market can be so illiquid. You know, how do you 
how do you value those options and how do you liquidate them without disturbing the market or getting unfair prices? Very interesting problems. Um, cool. So kind of closing up here, I'd like to ask a few uh, fun questions. The first one is if there's someone who wants to pursue a trading career at Wintermute, what kind of traits do you look for or what kind of advice would you give to someone who maybe is new to their career and wants to do a trading career and would like to work for Wintermute one day? Yeah, I think it's basically like kind of like know what you sign for, mm. uh, which would be like we have a pretty unique, distinct culture. Like we give people like a lot to like it's 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 really a lot to do in general. Like it's very abnormal working hours. Very like I don't think like work life balance is something people should expect uh, at least at the beginning of their career. But also to be honest, like the, the most successful people at uh, Vintermeet are the people with very little work life balance. So mm -hmm. it's just something. But I think it's kind of like advice I would give to anyone at the beginning of their training career is just like those are the those are the years you just need to sacrifice your work life balance to to get something. Like you cannot get those. Like it's that's that's how it works. So this not just in Germany, but most of the training companies. Um and ultimately, at some point, like the way you grow is you just take as much responsibility as possible, like being very entrepreneurial, which is kind of like another thing that was really great at Boxover as well. Like it was a very entrepreneurial environment, like you would be put on the spot and you can do pretty much almost anything you want to the spot. Like you develop it however you want. And at Wintermute, we kind of like pursue the same kind of model. Like, okay, you start with something like, okay, you start as a trainee, you some very mundane tasks, probably monitor some parameters or whatever, like moving the inventory rounds, just just to get a basically idea of how what the system does and like what things you need to be looking at. But at some point you like grow confident enough and then you will get like more projects that you make of your own, like integrating your exchange, for example, which we like love giving as a like one of the first tasks to uh, any joiners. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's really interesting about the work-life balance thing. I, I agree, like the trading in general, the best traders really like the markets all, you know, so much that that's all they think about. Um, so, you know, it's almost, it almost feels like a balanced life because that's, that's what you like to do. So it's very interesting. Um, outside of work for yourself, what do you like to do for hobbies or uh, anything fun? I have a question, yeah. <laughs> No, like for me, yeah, work life balance doesn't doesn't exist at all. But like it's it's a bit easier for partners as well because like all like trader on like really high up. Yeah, like the work is your life, so it's it's it just makes sense to like uh, yeah, like I work seven seven days a week pretty much. So it's yeah, like there is no there's not so much life out how to work, but like I do like to reset every now and then and all like do something on the side. Like I I'm, I'm doing some I would call it like meditative kind of things, which is oh. basically, which for me is basically like Warhammer, like, you know, this like plastic miniatures that you assemble and paint. Mm -hmm. That's basically what I do in my, when I have a spare time or when I just need to unwind a bit. Um, I don't like play the play Warhammer itself, but I just like assemble and paint and I get a lot of like pleasure out of it. Uh, and I don't know, well, that's what else. Yeah, occasionally Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons as well. Oh, nice. That's more more fun. Like we we actually have a few groups at uh, Wintermit uh, that are doing it, which I'm part of as well. So that's uh, that's that's, cool. that's quite fun. It's becoming just like a nice social activity, and it's also kind of, there's, there's, there is there is a bit of a min maxing like uh, quant element as well <laughs> in it because you need to like optimize your moves and then find some whatever. So, but yeah, it's like nice combination between role play and so mass. Yeah, that's pretty fun. I haven't played Dungeons Dragons in years, but I remember it was fun when I played a long time ago. So that's cool. And then the last question here, um, do you have any books that you recommend that you found very impactful over your career that you'd like to share with listeners? Yeah, I'd say like what got me into finance in general was probably, well, definitely Blair Sporker. Uh, that's still, yeah, that's still classic. Uh, like I wouldn't read anything by Michael Lewis after that, but uh, like that, that one was really good. Um, there was one about uh, long-term capital management uh, when Genius failed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was pretty good because I just you just learned a lot about like 
uh, there's a big hedge funds back from it. Um, and I think like, well, not more recent, but I think it's like 10 years ago, but uh, there is one about ETF trading in particular, which I found like super funny and also insightful. And it's called Street Freak uh, by Jared Dillon. Yeah, it's, it's, that one is just super funny, but it's also like, it literally describes the life of ETF trader. Wow. Which you have market bank. It's just, it's just really funny. Very cool. Very cool. I read two of two of those three. So I, I got to check out that Street Freak book. That looks great. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This is really interesting. I'm so glad we finally got to meet and have you on the podcast. I think listeners learn a lot. And so thank you for your time. Yep. Always happy. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. We'll see you. We'll see you all next time.